Uh, I believe we are recording um, now. So um, we're going to be talking, like I said, about um, hedging um, and the, the strategies uh, that we're going to use um, as we're hedging. So, okay. Um, and so we're going to talk about two different types of, of hedges, uh, long and short hedges. Um, it really just has to do with what are you wanting to do with your hedge, right? So if your idea is, uh, I know I need to buy this in the future, um, then what you're going to do is go into a long position, right? And if you're saying, I know I need to sell this in the future, um, then what you're going into is a short position, right? So um, if you, if you're building a hedge, you know what you're planning to hedge against, right? I, I'm going to sell this in the future. I don't want the price to move against me, or I need to buy this in the future. I don't want the price to move against me. Um, and so you'll go into a longer short hedge. So as I go through this, just understand, um, you know, what, what long and short means in this context. So, so a long hedge, you're going to buy it, um, some point in the future, you want to lock in the price today. Okay. Um, so why, why would you hedge? Um, see, I, I list some things, you know, to minimize risk from interest rates, exchange rates, you know, anything that could happen, right? Um, and, you know, that, that should be probably pretty straightforward. Um, you know, oftentimes people don't, uh, don't have a problem understanding why you hedge. I mean, we do things today like buy insurance, right? And, and all we're doing with insurance is I'm saying, okay, I'm going to take a known loss of $100, a month, but in the event there's a bad, you know, event that happens in the future, uh, my losses, you know, will be capped, right? But I do so knowing that if I, let's say I'm driving my car and I'm very safe and, and I never have an accident, I, I paid for this hedge that, that never worked for me, right? Um, or this insurance that, that I never had to use. So, um, so a lot of times people understand why you do hedges. And so, so these should be pretty, pretty straightforward. It's just a way of minimizing those risks. Um, so, so why not hedge, right? Um, well, well, first of all, is you gotta think, why am I hedging, right? If I'm hedging to protect my shareholders, well, shareholders probably have a diversified portfolio anyway, right? And so they shouldn't be as concerned with some of these day-to-day -day operations of the firm, right? Because they're, they're not gonna be rewarded for holding risk within our firm, right? If you um, took the investments course already, uh, I know it, it was discussed in there, but but even in the the intro finance course, you know, we um, talk about the importance of understanding idiosyncratic risk that's unique to that particular investment, and then systemic risk. Those are the things that are in the the market itself, just as a nature of the market. Right, and, and we always say how you're not gonna be rewarded for taking on uh, or holding risks that could be uh, diversified away, right? And so if you think from that standpoint that, hey, investors need to plan for their own um, portfolio and we're just one component of it, um, it's not worth us doing that, right? It'd probably be better off to allow them to use their own portfolio to offset any risk. Um, it also can, can be detrimental if I'm hedging and no one else is, um, then I can be putting myself in a situation where, uh, I could, I could have losses that other firms don't. Right. And so my firm could actually end up being, uh, more erratic or the stock price could be more erratic than a customer, which means I'm viewed as riskier right? Because I've, I've introduced more risk, but the market's not going to reward that risk um, in and of itself, right? Um, and the, the third piece there, uh, explaining a situation where you lost money on the hedge and you gained on the underlying can be difficult. Uh, I have an example I'm going to talk about later um, where a German um, energy firm was in that very same situation. And I know I brought this up a couple of days ago talking about um, you know, game, GameStop, right, and that stock and how people were experiencing this squeeze, right, uh, this short squeeze. And, and this can happen in futures, some, a similar type of situation where um, there's this difference between the short term and the long term, 
And in the short term, I could have all these margin calls going on, you know, where every day I got to deposit more money. Uh, when we talked about margin on Tuesday, you know, we said that uh, if it falls below that maintenance uh, requirement, then you'll get that margin call. Um, to try to explain to people why we have to keep paying all this money for my hedge, but it's going to pay off in a couple of years, uh, can be really difficult. Um, and so uh, because of that type of challenge, uh, you could be better off just not getting uh, involved in that. Uh, and so that would be another argument uh, against hedging. So we're going to sort of go with that we're hedging, but just understand when you go work for a firm, uh, they're not necessarily going to want you to be in this position you know, of hedging or not hedging, because uh, there could be a lot of corporate strategy involved, right? So just understand, I'm going to talk about hedging and stuff, but there could be situations where your firm just doesn't want to hedge. And, uh, and, and hopefully you'll understand um, why that's the case. Okay. Um, one of the things that comes up uh, whenever we're doing hedges uh, is this basis risk, right? And um, they, they define basis as this difference between the spot and the future. Um, but there's a couple of, well, I guess about three different places that this can come from, right? So um, it could be you cannot actually buy a hedge for exactly what you want, right? There can be things that are similar, uh, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, and because of that slight difference, now you've got this basis risk because your underlying necessarily is different than the uh, future contract or that future contract. Remember we talked about those are set standards, you know, and that type of thing. And I might be trading something that, that doesn't fit that mold. Um, and we know that there's a push to get away from a lot of those over the counter, uh, you know, types of trades and that type of thing. So, um, so that, that can be an issue uh, that arises. Um, you can have some uncertainty about your dates, right? And so if I don't know exactly when I want to buy or sell in the future, when I'm, when I'm adjusting my uh, hedge, you know, there's an assumption that I know when I want to do this. Um, and so because there is some uncertainty around that, uh, that in and of itself can introduce another one of these um, risks, right? And then um, the, the final bit would be because you may have to close out your hedge uh, before the, the delivery month, right? And so if you remember our little graphs on Tuesday, where we talked about um, Cotango and uh, normal backwardation, um, you know, there, there was a gap between the future and the spot price, right? The spot could be higher, the future could be higher, um, but, there, but there would be some sort of difference and then they eventually converge at the time uh, that they come in. So, you know, because you may need to close out earlier than you would actually make the, um, the, the decision for the purchase or the, or the sale of an asset, um, that, that difference in timing can also introduce um, that basis risk, right? So, so the, a lot of different things can go into why the spot in the futures um, will be different, um, but we sort of lump them together and call that basis risk. Right, because there's something going on. Either the asset itself is different, um, the timing itself is uncertain, uh, or the fact that even if it's certain, the the difference in timing between a futures contract and a spot uh, transaction, um, any of those can can introduce this um, basis issue. Okay, um, and so first I'm going to talk about a long hedge, and then I'm talk about a, a short hedge, um, but if you think of it in this way, um, we'll use F sub one and F sub two uh, to be the futures price, right? So F sub one is the futures price at time one, uh, F sub two, that's the futures price at, at time two. Um, and so what we hope, um, you know, is that the, the gain on the future, right, uh, is gonna make up for um, the, this asset uh, price. And so 
uh, S sub two, right? Because I'm not buying it at, at time one. I'm going to go into my hedge at time one, uh, but I'm actually going to to purchase the asset at time two. So the spot price at time two is what I would pay, but then I would save the gain from the future. Right, so hopefully that makes sense. So I'm gonna pay S2 to buy the asset, but I'm gonna receive F2 minus F1, right? And so you can, if we rearrange this, this would be S2 minus F2 plus F1, right? That minus sign, if you carried it through, it would flip that to positive, right? And so the S2 minus F2, that difference in the spot and futures price, we call that the basis, right? And so what I'm gonna pay is the futures price at the time that I initially set this up, plus whatever that basis is. Right, now what about someone going short, right? What's the difference with, uh, with, with a short contract? Well, if I'm short, then I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna sell this at the future for some amount of money, right? And so you're gonna pay me whatever S2 is, right? I know I'm selling this in the future. Uh, and so to offset the hedge, you know, I'm gonna set this up at, with this F1 and then subtract off the, the F2, right? And this is gonna be the gain in my futures position, right? So when I was long, it was F2 minus F1. Uh, when I'm short, it's F1 minus F2. Right, this has to do with, with the timing. That's, that's the difference in being long and short. And in fact, you could think of it as being a mill uh, purchasing corn from a farmer, right? To the mill, they're just trying to lock in their price on what the corn will be in six months. Uh, for a farmer, you're trying to lock in what the price will be in six months, right? So there's somebody taking the other side. Uh, but if we look at how much money they're gonna receive, right? They're gonna receive S2, and then they're gonna receive whatever this gain is, right? And so again, we end up with F1 plus S2 minus F2 or F1 plus B2. So that's how much they would receive, which is identical to how much they pay because this is a zero sum game, right? If somebody's taking uh, the long position, someone out there is taking the short. Now the short could be um, like the, you know, the other side, like I talked about a farmer and a mill um, but it could be a speculator, right? Someone that just has something to invest and they, they feel, hey, you know, if I, uh, if I invest this way, I'm gonna get a, a good return uh, as part of my larger investment portfolio. I wanna be in these commodities markets. You know, there, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and in fact, as we go through this, if you find commodities interesting, that's the um, FINRA series three uh, exam, um, which is a, a pretty cool, um, Pretty cool test to take, uh, you know, if you, if you want to get into that kind of brokerage work. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so that's that's the long and the short, right? Um, and so they would, uh, what one pays, the other one receives, you know, but but it ends up being um, that futures plus whatever that, that basis difference um, is. So, okay. Um, as far as the contracts themselves, uh, you want to get a delivery month as close to, but not later than uh, the edge of the hedge uh, or the, the age of the hedge. Um, so you think of it this way, uh, it's kind of like the um, Price is Right. I don't know if you guys ever watched that game show where they would show, hey, here's a grandfather clock, you know, from, from this uh, this manufacturer, you know, and they, they have the, the lady come by and she's, opens the doors, you know, and shows you what it looks like and everything. And then everybody has to guess what will it be. And you want to be the closest without going over. And that's kind of how these contracts are. You want to be as close to possible to when you're going to sell, but you don't want to go past that. Right. Uh, and that's because you can get this divergence, you know, because of this basis. Um, and so that you'll end up you know, being in a situation where you're trying to close out your hedge and you may end up taking some, some additional losses because of that timing issue, right? So, so you want it to be before when you're gonna sell, uh, not after. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned this already, uh, if there's no futures contract uh, on what you're actually trying to hedge, um, then you wanna get something that's really close to it. But close to it doesn't mean 
um, okay, this is oil, so I need to use some other petroleum product, or uh, this is corn, and so I need some other grain. Um, because what, well, those can, can sometimes be what, what's best. Uh, what you're really trying to do is say, which one correlates the best, right? Because that's what this is all going to be based upon is correlation. And so remember, um, if, you're, if you're being driven by the same type of events, um, then the, the correlation uh, can, can work really well. Um, if, if it's not, even if you're doing a, a similar, even the same type of product, you can, you can get divergence. And so just as a, a personal aside, when I wrote my dissertation uh, for my PhD, one of the essays that I, I wrote, a paper I wrote, uh, was looking at coffee farmers in Uganda, right? And so Uganda would pay what was known as the gate price. And that's literally the price that they would receive when the truck drove by the gate of their farm and picked up the bags of coffee, right? And so every morning, uh, actually it was a weekly price, but whenever they would, they would do the farm report and they would do this, uh, you know, just like farm reports are in the US, you know, but they would do these in Uganda and all the farmers would turn on their radio early in the morning and they would hear what the current price is and then they would decide, do I wanna go out and deliver? Right, and you would take it out, like I said, down the road to, to wherever the main highway is and they would stack up their coffee. The folks would come by, they would weigh it out and they'd say, yep, this is, you know, 300 kilos of, of beans, so here's your money, okay? Uh, the issue is um, coffee is extremely important to Uganda, right? It's a major driver of Uganda's economy, but Uganda is not important to coffee. Right. If you look at the major coffee producers, everybody thinks of um, Columbia, right? The, the Columbia uh, Folgers coffee. Uh, and they think about um, uh, Kenya a lot of times, you know, with um, or the, you know, Arabica coffee coming out of Kenya and, uh, and, and Egypt. But the other big players are countries like Mexico, Brazil, and Vietnam, right? And so these countries um, produce a great deal of coffee. Right, they, they dominate the market. Um, and their weather patterns are not like Uganda's weather patterns. So it's really easy for Uganda to have a really high production, uh, but worldwide production doesn't go up with it. Uh, similarly, and this is the part that we always worry about, um, worldwide production does great, right? Causing prices to fall, but Uganda's production goes down. So what little coffee they do make, they don't get much money for it. Um, and so even though they were growing the same product, uh, I was trying to see how effective that was um, or how effective it would be to hedge uh, using international coffee markets. Um, and it was, it was actually very, very difficult because of that um, lack of correlation, even though they're both coffee, right? Uh, and so that's what I'm saying. You got to focus on the correlation, uh, not the name of the product. Right, and so um, uh, this this uh, as a little aside of some research that I've done um, specifically on on this type of area, um, and so uh, when we're looking at this uh, hedge ratio, and and you'll probably hear me call this, you know, um, H star, and and I'll show you H hat in a bit, and so uh, there's a couple of different ways that we go about creating a hedge. Uh, a lot of times it depends on how volatile your market is and, and things like that, but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but what we're doing um, is we're, we're basically trying to figure out, okay, I know I'm going to spend a million dollars, but I, that doesn't mean I need a million dollar hedge, particularly if we don't have perfect correlation, which we don't in the real world. Um, and, and so we're trying to, to build um, the, the optimal hedge, which is not necessarily 100% hedging, okay? Uh, and so the, the formula that we use, H star is equal to, I know this looks like a P, um, but that's a lowercase rho, uh, the Greek letter rho. Um, and so whenever you see that, that's, that always means, um, you know, this correlation between the two, right? Um, and then you see there's a sigma sub S and a sigma sub F, right? So sigma sub S is the standard deviation of the changes in your spot price. So, um, so we, we look at how much the spot price changes and then we see how much variance there is around that change. 
So, so it's the change of the change kind of thing. Um, and then same thing down here is the change, the standard deviation of the change in the forward price. So when you see delta, that's the change in something. Whenever you see sigma, that's sort of how much noise there is around that. Um, and then anytime you see, like I said, I know it looks like a P, but it's rho whenever you see that, that's just how strongly correlated they are. So a row of one, um, that's like somebody lifting a barbell and their arms go up and down perfectly together, right? That's row of one. Um, and if row was negative one, that means one goes up and the other one comes down. So think of it like pistons in a car, or if you're pedaling a bicycle, right? One foot goes up as the other one comes down, right? That, that type of thing. So uh, we don't find those in the real world very much. That tends to be uh, more of our cool mathematical things. Um, but, but you could have anything in between. Now, um, if, if rho is equal to zero, uh, that means there's no correlation. One does one thing, the other one does something else, and I can't really find, you know, this linear relationship, uh, then you're not going to be able to hedge with that, right? There's just, there has to be a relationship uh, for us to have the hedge. And if you put in zero uh, for the row here, you see this whole thing would go away. Um, and so your optimal hedge would be uh, no hedge. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so that's that's the equation that, that we're going going to use, and I, uh, I have an example here. So um, this is how um, oh goodness, Southwest Southwest Airlines um, really really was able to grow, particularly after um, the events of like 9/11 that really shook up the airline industry. I know a lot of you folks are, are probably pretty young, so you may not uh, remember pre 9/11, post 9/11 flying, but um, but there was just a lot of consolidation. A lot of airlines went out of business. A lot of uh, ancillary services went out of business. So it, it changed the nature of that market. Uh, but Southwest did really well because one of the things that they've been doing this whole time is, is trying to hedge um, all those things that they couldn't control, right? Um, and so you have an airline that's going to purchase 2 million gallons of jet fuel in one month, uh, and they're going to hedge using home heating oil, right? Now, uh, home heating oil, um, uh, it's like F6, you know, it's just, uh, it's kerosene, basically. Uh, and it's really similar to jet fuel. Uh, jet fuel is, is pretty much kerosene, although uh, JP5, JP8, or, or what they call those. There, there's some small differences, I mean, with like viscosity, especially at, at low temperature, because air, airplanes fly so high, uh, the temperature uh, drops uh, dramatically. Um, where they are. And so the, the fuel has to be something that is still able to be pumped easily or easily enough, um, you know, through the system. And so there, there's a few differences between just straight kerosene, but it, it's really close. Um, and so uh, the, the hedge isn't perfect. Uh, if you see here, uh, we have a row of 0.92, but that is really close, especially for a real world type of stuff. Um, and so this is, this is really similar, um, you know, to, to a one. Um, and then we could say, okay, well, we see how much the futures price is changing and how much the, the spot price, today's fuel prices uh, are changing, you know, the variance, uh, uh, the standard deviation, I should say the square root of the variance uh, for each of those. And then we just put those three numbers in, right? So uh, 0.928 and then times those, and that gives us 0.78. And so what that means is um, optimally, we want to hedge... 78% uh, of our 2 million gallons here, right? That, that's what this is coming back with, that 0.78, that's what it's telling us, okay? Um, and so how many contracts would that be? Well, it's 0.78 times the 2 million gallons, right? That's whatever that ends up being. Um, it's over 1.5 million gallons, but we're gonna do these in contracts um, of 42,000. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a, I should have put that up. I missed that line up here. Um, Cause the, the futures are 42 gallons, uh, 42,000 gallons each. Uh, and so you, that would be 37 contracts, right? Um, and again, it's not gonna be a perfect hedge, right? It, it cannot be perfect because our row is not gonna be one, right? And so we're not gonna be able to, to do this perfectly. Um, uh, and, but before I move on, uh, you know, I'd mentioned rho could go from negative one to one, 
right? Well, what if rho is negative? Well, what that means is you're, you're buying something that has this correlation uh, that moves opposite. And so you end up doing the opposite of what you would think. So even though you would say, well, I need a long position because your futures are moving in the opposite direction, it actually looks like a short hedge, right? Because you're going to come up with a negative number because if you put a negative number in here, the sigma is always going to be positive because it's the square root of the variance, right? And I'm, I'm, so I'm always going to get a, a positive number uh, there. So this um, fraction is always going to be a positive number. Um, so if this is negative, then obviously my hedge ends up being negative. And what that means is you're going to, uh, like I said, act in the um, in the opposite direction, right? Than you would than you would think. Okay. Um, and so that's this is the, that that H star uh, approach to getting an optimal um, hedge. And and what we're trying to do is minimize the variance of our position, right? That, that's what we're doing with our head is we're trying to, like I said, with insurance, you, you have a known loss. I pay that premium uh, and it's a, it's a guaranteed loss, but it's guaranteed. I don't have a lot of variance around that. Um, in fact, my, my risk is in that I'll have an accident, but it's gonna be insufficient to justify going to insurance. Either it's below my deductible or it's just above and it's not worth the increase in my insurance cost. Um, and so that's, that, that's a loss because I didn't perfect, I wasn't able to perfectly hedge, um, uh, because of like the deductible. Right. Uh, and so, um, but by having that insurance, I've, I've minimized the variance because while I do have some of these known losses, because there are known losses, it doesn't change. Right. So, um, so that's what we're talking about with variance, um, in that case. So, um, so a, a different, um, approach is using H hat, right? So, so H star, um, you know, it, it minimizes um, what this variance, um, you know, looks like, but this, this is using um, these, the, the percentage of daily change. And you may think, well, what's the point of doing uh, percentages? Um, the, the math becomes pretty elegant when you are doing uh, natural logs, right? And so a lot of what we do with these types of uh, markets, um, we'll end up taking the natural log because stock prices or the underlying price, uh, you know, will often follow what's called a log normal distribution. Um, and so it just, it, like I said, it just makes the math a bit more elegant, right? And so um, it could be easier to do this type of calculation um, because you're using this percentage change, not just the, um, the delta, right? Which is the actual um, change, right? So, um, so this is just a slightly different way of, of calculating it. Uh, but if you notice, it looks really similar. We just have hats everywhere. Uh, and but we'll talk about the the difference between um, optimal hedge, you know, H star versus H hat, you know, sometimes. But uh, but we use H star a lot here to to begin with. Um, and so, if if we think of it in terms of units, like so, the quantity, um, you know, for the whatever our asset is, and then the quantity uh, in one future. Um, then by multiplying H star by this, you know, this, this is kind of what we were doing um, when we had the fuel purchase, right? The 2 million gallons, um, you know, we're, we're going to quant, we're, the, the Q sub A is the 2 million gallons and the Q sub F is the 42,000 gallons, right? And then we multiplied that times our H star, right? Which was based on that. Um, if we have the H hat, um, which takes into consideration some of those issues with uh, the fact that we have to settle, we can get margin calls, that, that kind of thing. Um, then, then what you're using is this value at those times, right? Because um, you have to remember that, um, what you would want to do is every time your value changes at the end of the day is you recalculate and then you change your hedge. Um, it's not always feasible to do that because you do have transaction costs, right? And just like 
in the real world, I need to constantly be looking at insurance rates and, and trying to find out the best one and switching insurance companies and things like that. In the real world, we don't always do that. Uh, we, we tend to sort of lock ourselves in and continue on. So, um, so the H hat um, is probably the much more robust way of doing it. Um, but it's going to be the one that's going to be a lot harder to, to not only do, but to also keep up with. Um, so um, that, that tailing um, hedge allows for a lot more, but, but again, it just, um, it, it's just a different way of doing the, the, the same type of hedge. Uh, and H star tends to be close enough. So depending on the type of business you're in and how important this hedge is uh, as part of your larger portfolio, uh, it could make sense just to do the, the H star. Okay. Um, and then the, the, the other one I want to talk about is, uh, is using indexes. So um, the, an index, I mean, this can be the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, you, you'll see that when used a lot. Uh, the S&P 500, uh, NASDAQ 100, the Russell 1000, right? Any, any of those things that you see pop up, uh, if you ever watch CNBC and they'll, they'll have the, these indices come up. Um, but what, uh, what if I have this portfolio, I don't want to get out of this portfolio. I mean, we had mentioned, um, I think it was last week when, when we did a, had a conversation about it. And I said, these could be really effective um, if you're in a position where you own a lot of something and if you were to sell it, it would put you in a bad position. So you may need to hold it, uh, but you need access to the, the cash, right? Uh, so Jeff Bezos, I don't know if you guys heard, uh, but he's uh, stepping down uh, from Amazon. Uh, he's gonna focus on his space stuff. Um, he's kind of like Elon Musk where he's got two different big projects. You know, Elon does all the, the Dragon X and all those launches. And he also has the Boring Company, which is a big company that digs holes underground. Um, and Jeff Bezos has a couple of the same things. Um, okay, I got a chat. Uh, oh, you didn't know about Jeff Bezos? Okay. Yeah, it, it, I think it came out yesterday, may, may have been the day before. Um, but yeah, he said he was he was going to step down and focus on his on his other stuff. I think, oh man, it's blue something. Um, but yeah, he's got a, um, a big facility out in New Mexico. Um, and he, he's got a couple of big projects out there. And it's funny because you have these two people that are very different and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and both of them are involved in two big projects. One is putting more stuff in space. And the other one's digging big holes underground. Um, cause he's, he's digging out a bunch of stuff. Um, he, he's worried, I think about his legacy. Uh, so he's got this millennium project where they're building a millennial clock and, and stuff that it, it's, you don't have to wind it, but like every thousand years or something, it's supposed to. It's like the pyramids, I guess. It's going to be one of those things out in the desert um, in New Mexico, and somebody will find, you know, be like, "Wow, these people were smart" or something. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah. So, um, but he doesn't want to go and sell all of his stock because imagine if he were to just start dumping stock, right? Or if uh, Zuckerberg started just dumping Facebook stock, right? The, the the signal to the market would be run for the hills, probably. So. Uh, so to prevent that, you can you can hedge using these index futures to sort of lock in what you have now. Um, and so this equation, I know it looks really similar, right, to, to what we were doing just a minute ago with the uh, with the H hat. Um, you know, where it was like, um, you know, we have the, those values, um, you know, uh, but what we're actually going to use, though, um, instead of rho, we're gonna use beta, right? And you may remember beta is just the correlation between whatever your asset is, be it a, an individual stock or a portfolio um, to the market, right? And so instead of calling it rho, uh, we have beta here, right? And then we have the value of our portfolio, right? And then whatever the future is. So um, if, I, if I'm trying to offset this risk and I'm gonna use, um, you know, whatever makes more sense, the S&P or, or, uh, or the, the NASDAQ or, or the, the Dow Jones Industrial, um, you know, so we're going we're gonna to do the same type of calculation, uh, but we can actually use these index futures, 
right to um, uh, to do that. So um, so we can we can even hedge on those positions. So um, so this is kind of an example, right? So the the futures price uh, is a thousand currently. Uh, I've got a five million dollar portfolio. Um, a contract is 250 times the index. So one contract would be $250,000, right? I'm trying to make this easy math for myself, um, right? So it's $250,000 for one contract. My portfolio is 5 million, right? So I hope that makes sense, right? So, so you have 5 million in your numerator and then 250,000 uh, in your denominator. Right. And so my portfolio is 20 times um, what a contract is. Right. So it'd be 20 contracts. Right. But my beta isn't one, it's 1.5. Right. So it'd be the 20 contracts times the 1.5 beta. Um, and so it would actually end up being uh, 30 contracts. Right. I need 30 contracts um, to offset my risk because my portfolio is more risky than the market itself. Um, okay, uh, so what if I want to change that, right? Uh, maybe I don't like the 1.5, you know, uh, you know, if you're retiring, you might say, look, I, I want um, a better uh, beta, right? I, I want to change my beta, um, you know, instead of 1.5, I'd rather it be uh, 0.75, right? I want, I want it to be half as risky um, as it otherwise would be, right? So if I'm going long, right, like this example I was using is um, long, um, then, then what I'm gonna end up doing is saying, okay, well, let me just subtract 1.5 minus what I want it to be, right? So when I'm trying to go, um, you know, to, to the new beta, I'll put in the difference there. Right, and if I'm trying to actually make it riskier, right, then suddenly you know I'm going, you know, I'm going to end up with that negative number again, and what that means is I actually end up shorting the index, and I can actually increase the beta uh, of my portfolio, right? And so um, you know the the difference um, is going to be instead of saying beta times the the fraction, you know, my portfolio over the the futures contract, it's going to be the the, the change in the beta, right? So we would say delta beta, uh, but it, it's the that triangle is is capital delta, um, and so that's again always going to be the change in. So whatever I want that um, uh, beta to change, right? Um, then I end up. Uh, changing what my um, uh, portfolio is, like the, the holding in my portfolio. Uh, and if, if I'm increasing it, then what I'm actually going to end up doing is even though it's long, I, I would short, or if I'm trying to take a short position, um, then, then I would go long. So, um, so yeah, so that would, that's, that's how we would use that to, to change um, the, the beta of the, of the portfolio, right? Um, so why do this, right? It could be you, you just want to be out of the market for a while, right? And so it's like, I kind of just want to lock in this portfolio and jump right back in after my six month cruise around the world, you know, or, or something like that. Um, you may need to be out of the market for a while because um, you, you've done some, some naughty things, right? Um, like Elon Musk is no longer um, the head of his company. Uh, he had to step away from that position. Uh, the SEC mandated that as part of his agreement because he had uh, tweeted some information about his stock and it was seen as being um, manipulative to the market, right? Because he was saying something and that was being taken as an official statement. Uh, and you, you're just not allowed to officially say certain things, right? I mean, you're allowed to say, oh, this product's coming out. You're not allowed to say this product's coming out and our stock price will definitely hit four hundred dollars, right? That's, there's there's a difference there, um, and so you know if you if you're not allowed to do certain things in the market, uh, this is a way of, of doing that. Um, in theory, you know you could have like elected officials or somebody do this, but normally they they have them put it in something different called a blind trust, uh, and that's where you don't even know what you're invested in. 
um, so that would eliminate a lot of that type of position. But you could say, okay, set up a blind trust, but immediately hedge it or something. Um, and you, you could do that as well. Although I, don't, I'm, I think once they do a blind trust, they're sort of out of it. Um, but yeah, so, um, but yeah, so that's, um, yeah. And if, you, if you're pretty sure you're gonna beat the market, um, you know, then you, you might wanna do that as well, but <clears throat> uh, that's a different type of position. Um, okay, and stack and roll, this is something that I mentioned on Tuesday. I kinda of wanted to make sure I um, kind of went over that again. Um, so the idea was stack and roll. This is what I said that, that we did, although, um, we were offsetting diesel uh, prices, right? Because the the shipping that, that I was doing in the international paper was was truck and rail. Uh, there were some ships uh, involved, but but by and large, the stuff I was focused on was trucking and rail shipments, and both of those obviously rely on diesel. Um, and so, uh, what we would do is have a series of contracts, and then we could um, close them, and then just keep rolling that into this new contract. Um, so that we always had something sort of coming up um, and, and it allowed us a lot of flexibility. Um, so if things started to move in a different way, we could just say, hey, let's just stop with the hedge for a little bit, you know, and then we'll jump back in, you know, um, prices are really high right now. They're gonna have to drop soon, you know, or, or something. I, we, could, we could be in a situation where uh, just having that flexibility was, was valuable in and of itself. So it wasn't so much um, we're going to do this one thing and let's build for this one thing. It's more, we're always doing this thing, but we never want it to really hurt us. So what can we do to, to sort of keep this going? So that's where the, um, the stack and roll, um, comes in. Right. Um, and I believe this is actually going to be my last slide today, just talking about, um, liquidity. Right. Um, and so there's an example here of, uh, I'm gonna say this wrong, I'm, I'm sure, but uh, uh, Mattel Gesellschaft, uh, which was this German firm, um, they're publicly traded as MG. Um, so what they did was they said, all right, we are selling, um, you know, this stuff to to the market, right? And, and we're talking about like five, 10 year type of contracts, right? These are, these are pretty far out. Um, and so what they did was they said, okay, um, we're gonna supply heating oil and gasoline because they were doing refinery work. And um, so the oil comes in, they crack it, it comes off as all sorts of different products and they all have different customers. And so what they did was they went ahead and locked in um, oil and gasoline. Um, and you know it was a pretty good deal for them. It was like six cents above market you know, um, and then what they did was, all right, we need to short um, to offset this position, right? Um, they had these short futures contracted um, that they would just keep continually roll. So it was like a stack and roll with these short positions because they had these long contracts that were, uh, that were out there. Um, and so what ended up happening was the prices fell. Right, and when the prices fell, they ended up in a situation where, in the short term, they needed a lot of money. Right, they were getting margin calls and stuff on those positions, um, but they weren't really going to get the money until you know five years in the future. Right, and so uh, what ended up happening was, as this fell, at first people were okay with it. Right, and you kind of imagine the GameStop situation going on. Right, where the first day it's like, ha ha, that's funny. And then after about a week, you know, that, you know, whatever it was, the $5 billion in margin calls that have happened, um, you know, everybody started saying, okay, this isn't actually funny anymore. We, we need to, you know, people started to get, you know, saying that, I don't know, the Russians were involved or something, but, um, but that's, that's the position that you take when you get into these type of contracts, sometimes it works against you. Uh, and in this case with, with MG, um, they ended up losing about 1.3 billion uh, before they finally just said, we're, we're done with this, right? Um, and so they ended up abandoning those contracts, you know, and, and just took the loss, you know, the 1.3 billion um, US dollars. So 
So even large firms can get in really bad ways. Um, and, and this is an issue that comes up a lot in finance. In fact, we're going to talk about this particular type of thing a lot with the liquidity issues, right? Where um, individuals will um, have this brilliant strategy, you know, but you have to make you have to make the payments in the short term until you get the big payoff, right? Um, and so the, if you think about, um, you know, if you were able to go to a roulette wheel and just keep betting, on, on whatever and just keep keep playing um, the the strategy that they always talk about is sort of this, this doubling so you, you start betting with like a dollar and then if you lose you bet two dollars and then if you lose you bet four dollars right and you just keep going and then eventually you'll win and your winnings will pay off all of those losses because you've doubled every time right well the thing is you could you know after you know ten doublings you're at a thousand dollars right? And then you're um, 10 more, you're at a, a million dollars, right? So, so as, you're, as you're going through these doublings, um, it could be in a position where you just don't have the, the liquidity, you don't have the cash, right? To, to keep putting on the table. Uh, and so even though, you know, mathematically, this would eventually work for you, um, do you have enough money to get you there, right? And so that, that type of liquidity trap um, can, can be quite the issue, right? So, um, so yeah, that, that's it as far as the, um, that, that hedging piece, I kind of want to go over, uh, what we're doing when we build our hedges and, and that type of thing. Um, because what I wanted to get into next, um, what was after interest rates? Um, uh, oh, uh, pricing, the, the forward and future pricing. So, First, I wanted to get into exactly how we build those types of um, portfolios, uh, and then um, we'll we'll have um, the, the pricing side of it. So, any questions about about what we just did? Uh, and again, I'll have this video um, on YouTube, and I'll put the the link and an announcement as soon as the other one finishes, and then this one is able to get up. So, uh, and then. If you have that initial playlist, as I'm dropping them in that same playlist, you could probably just click that initial playlist link and it'll it'll have all of the lectures and I'm just naming them lecture one, lecture two, this is lecture three. Um, so they'll all just be there for you to, to go and rewatch. Okay. All right, so any questions at all on this? I don't have any questions. Okay. Well, I will see you guys on Tuesday. Uh, just be on the lookout for more announcements and stuff to come through. And uh, I'll just talk to you guys then. And if you have any questions and you want to email me or anything like that, feel free, right? Just just keep in mind, I'm, I'm always there. So just, uh, just go ahead and shoot me an email if you do have any questions that come up. All right.